two friends enjoy a sightseeing flight across scenic Alaska before an unplanned detour turns to disaster. I'll never forget him uh, looking at me and saying, we're gonna crash. And then there was a very loud noise. Then the lights went out. Hang on, buddy, I'm coming! Ah! Seriously injured and stranded in the middle of nowhere, they must hike to safety through terrain infested with grizzly bears. There was no pepper spray, there was no shotgun, there was nothing between us and them. You don't stand a chance against an animal like that. In their desperate bid for survival, their only hope is to rely on each other. Gary and I were going home, or we were gonna die trying. Kinnick River Valley in southern Alaska, an area of untamed natural beauty, overlooked by the majestic Chugach mountain range. Its most famous feature is the spectacular 45 kilometer long Kinnick Glacier. All set, Stuart. Take the other strut, Gary. In nearby Palmer, two friends are getting ready for a sightseeing flight to the glacier. Okay, clear on this side. Taking the pilot's seat is Dave Akers, a veteran flyer with thousands of hours under his belt. I've been flying aircraft since uh, 1974. It's rewarding, it's challenging. I really love to fly. Ah, <laughs> oh, man, this is what I'm really gonna miss. Texan Gary Knoll came north two years ago to work in Alaska's oil industry and quickly became firm friends with fellow outdoorsman Dave. Really appreciate this, Dave. We went out and did a lot of sightseeing together. We both had a mutual uh, admiration for the outdoors. I would just jump at every opportunity I had to go fly with them. I really haven't known Gary all that long, but uh, you know, Sometimes you just click. Dave's been teaching Gary the basics of flying, but this is their last lesson for a while. Gary and his family are returning home to Texas. Okay, Gary, there we go. Let's do it. The 80 kilometer round trip should take no more than two hours. Dave and Gary plan to be back before dusk. We were in just real remote scenery. No power lines, no roads, no um, human intervention in the land at all. Alaska is uh, just beautiful. It's uh, called the last frontier, and it truly is the last frontier. It's just, you can get away from civilization very easily up there. The weather stays fine as they track the river southeastwards. And after an hour, they reach their destination, the stunning Kinnick Glacier. It's probably some of the most magnificent scenery that I can relate to. And I've seen a lot of country in my life. Eager to land the plane while it's still daylight, Dave turns for home. And as we headed back towards the airport... Hey, Dave, look over there! 
I remember glancing over to the my right shoulder and, and seeing this mouth of this valley just opening up to our right there. Let's go check it out. Dave has never noticed this valley before. Hey, come on, there might not be no next time. Okay. Intrigued, he descends to take a closer look. But what Dave doesn't know is that this is a notorious spot where over a dozen planes have crashed before. I had a lot of trust in the airplane and a lot of trust in my ability. Just wanted to kind of get a feel for the environment. 15 minutes later, Dave starts his climb out. The valley was back behind us. I remember Dave just giving it full throttle. We don't seem to be going up. I did a quick instrument scan and noticed that I was going down at 200 feet a minute. I thought, something's not right. I immediately knew we were in a downdraft. The aircraft is caught in a column of rapidly descending cold air. Its 145 horsepower engine can't generate enough lift to overcome the powerful downward force. The plane is now plummeting towards the ground at over 10 meters per second. I needed to keep my wings level and get my airspeed as low as possible because we were gonna impact. no choice but to accept that. I'll never forget him uh, looking at me and saying, we're gonna crash. The impact was tremendous. <laughs> just loud and I thought, oh no, what have I done? Just feel the plane skidding and sliding. And then a big noise and then the lights went out. After skidding for 30 meters, the plane has come to rest. Over 1,200 meters up a remote mountainside. One of my first thoughts was, uh, here I am uh, covered in blood. I had a hard time focusing my eyes. Miraculously, both men have survived the crash. But Dave appears to be unconscious. I look around and I see Dave laid back in his seat and his eyes are just rolled up in his head. I'm thinking, man, this is not good. Can you hear me? I immediately start yelling at him, trying to get his get his attention. Hey, talk to me, man. Oh. He was incoherent. But their injuries are not the only problem. Dave, Dave, we gotta get out. Gasoline was uh, just pouring out. The force of the impact has ruptured the plane's fuel tanks. Get the door. The wreck could catch fire and explode at any moment. Oh. Come on, man. Oh. Gary must get his injured friend to safety. pulling and tugging on him and trying to get him out of the plane. Come on. He's not responding. Oh. I didn't have time to think, oh, are we gonna die or whatever. Oh. Oh. Come on. I just knew we gotta get away from the plane. Oh. 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 Come on. 
just kept yelling at him, come on, Dave, we got to move. we got to get out of here. Gary finally manages to drag Dave clear of the wreckage and out of danger. And the next thing I knew, I'm staring at the tundra. I recall thinking that we're two very lucky people to be alive. Against all odds, Dave and Gary have survived the crash, but both have sustained multiple injuries. I remember having a lot of, a lot of pain up in my right chest and shoulder area. And then I looked up at Gary, and he had a pretty good gash in his forehead. Oh. Oh. He's all look good. I'm OK. Gary doesn't know it, but he has a serious skull fracture. Dave has broken two ribs and fractured his collarbone. We needed to get some help quick, but nobody knew where we were at. I immediately started to feel guilty for what I had done. Their unplanned detour means they're well off the usual flight path, and they've left their mobile phones back at the airfield. Their last hope is the plane's high-frequency radio. But to reach it means braving the fuel-soaked fuselage. The gasoline was still just pouring out of the plane, and uh, we just determined we had to take a chance. Gary grabs vital emergency gear, while Dave checks the radio. A single spark could ignite the fuel, turning the wreck into a lethal fireball. I reached over to the master switch. I turned on the radio to see if there was anything there. There wasn't any power. It was just dead. It's a devastating blow. Out here, it could take weeks for rescuers to find them. Now there's only one option left. They must walk off the mountain while they're still strong enough. So we uh, gathered up everything we had. The men decide to head for the Kinnick River, where they hope to hit a logging road. But they set off woefully ill-equipped to survive in the harsh Alaskan wilderness. You reckon I ought to get a jacket? Ah, don't worry. We'll be up and back before you know it. I was dressed in my shorts, uh, T-shirt, my tennis shoes on. We just thinking we're going to go out for a quick sightseeing trip, but it's not the way to be dressed when you're out in the wilderness of Alaska. An inventory of the bag they salvaged from the plane reveals little by way of supplies. He had a little emergency bag that had some peanut butter, some bandages, some tarps, some old towels, a couple of sleeping bags. It was pretty limited, but uh, we were able to utilize some of the things in it. Before we started down the hill, I made a sling for Dave's arm. Sorry about this. We got to put a sling on this thing. Uh, okay, oh, okay, okay. Easy, oh. easy, easy, easy. Oh. Oh. Better? Huh? Yeah. All right. Thanks. Then I tore a uh, towel in half and Got the bleeding on my forehead stopped. But Dave and Gary are taking an almighty risk. They've crashed in an area with the largest brown bear population in North America. Often weighing in at over 300 kilos and standing at over two meters tall. The native brown bear is a fearsome predator capable of ripping through flesh and bone. And they can smell blood up to 30 kilometers away. Here I am uh, covered in blood, 
Dave is injured and uh, we're in bear country with no firearm. With 40 kilometers to cover to the nearest settlement, their chances of survival are slim. I would estimate we probably traveled uh, two, two and a half miles away from the plane. All right. The going was so tough, and uh, Dave was hurting. Dave's smashed rib cage makes every movement searingly painful. The pain was pretty intense, so at that point, I needed to rely on Gary's direction. Here, above 1,000 meters, nighttime temperatures can drop below freezing. And as the sun begins to set, both men start to feel bitterly cold. We're looking for ways to stay warm. So we uh, made some makeshift ponchos. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dave was uh, really struggling. And we decided to stop for the night. Concerned that pushing Dave on could exacerbate his injuries, Gary decides to make camp for the night. We laid our, one of the big tarps out and then uh, pulled the second tarp up over us. Dave and Gary desperately need rest, but they know that many of Alaska's fiercest animals come out to hunt at night. I wanted to really be just on alert, listening for bears. Weak, unarmed, and covered in blood, the men would be an easy meal for determined predators. Gary had had a bear encounter earlier that year where he actually had to shoot the bear. If he's going to come get you, he's going to come get you, and you're defenseless. Fearing for their lives, both men's thoughts turn to their families. We love our wives, and we love our kids, and that's where we wanted to be. I could only imagine at that point they must have thought we were probably probably dead. We were so compelled to get off that mountain for that reason, just to let them know that we were all right. Gary and I were going home, or we were going to die trying. As soon as there was enough light, I determined that uh, we needed to get moving. Come on, get up. We gotta get home. Pretty soon I hear this, uh, uh, hey Dave, we gotta go. We gotta get out of here. Oh, give me a break. You're hurting and you're tired. I laid there for what seemed to me like uh, three seconds. Look, if I can keep moving in this, you can too. He was getting really just uh, rigid from his injuries. I had to convince Dave several times that we needed to get up and going. Get up! Dave's injured body craves rest. But Gary knows that if they're to make it out alive, they must get moving. I was thinking that the best thing to do was to get up and start moving get the blood circulating, get, get some warmth going, help uh, perhaps boost the morale, just have a plan, put something into action. We had to backtrack out of the canyon that we flew up into. But you know, everything looks different on the ground than it does from the air. The going was so tough that Dave couldn't help from falling. I mean, he would fall on that shoulder several times and just grimace in pain. When you got a lot of pain like that on one side or the other, it's just really uncomfortable. It was kind of hard to keep the balance, but I needed to carry on. Dave and Gary hope that the Kanik River will lead them back to civilization. But to reach it, they will have to navigate their way across 40 kilometers of treacherous terrain. 
my concern really started growing there because uh, you just don't know what's down in the alder brush. We had enough blood about us that I would have rather been a, uh, a moving target to a bear than a sitting target to a bear. And then I spotted something moving off to our right and I just froze. There was a huge grizzly. We were literally just feet away from it. Dave and Gary are now face to face with a 300 kilo grizzly bear. It's their worst nightmare. You don't stand a chance against an animal like that. Largest predator in North America. They're upwind of the grizzly, so it hasn't smelt them yet. But should the wind change, the scent of blood will surely attract this fearsome predator. The two friends are in grave danger. The bear was just prowling back and forth. And then it turned back towards us. We are obviously in his territory and his domain. I thought to myself, hold still. I remember uh, Gary saying, Lord, help the bear to turn the other way. That's exactly what the bear did. We were so relieved when that happened. It just it was like we could breathe again, you know? We both looked at each other and said, this is not where we need to be right now. As quiet as possible, we sort of cut back at a 45 degree angle. We wanted to just put some distance between us and that bear. I remember looking back a few times, wondering if there was anything following us. And then uh, we noticed a large area that had been stomped around. Oh, no. It's fresh, isn't it? We were standing just feet away from this moose kill. When a uh, grizzly kills a uh, moose, it'll, it'll take it and bury it, and let it rot a little bit. Seeing that moose's head and legs and stuff sticking out of the ground, that was not a good feeling right there at that point. Dave and Gary have accidentally stumbled into the heart of the grizzly's lair. And I'm thinking, oh, great. You know, the bear's right down the stream from us. We're in its uh, kitchen here, and he or she would have been probably pretty aggressive if he thought we were invading on his, uh, on his kill. Brown bears are notoriously territorial, and the men know this one could return at any moment. There was no pepper spray. There was no shotgun. There was nothing between us and them, and absolutely no protection whatsoever. I'm thinking this bear's gonna come busting out of the woods any minute now. Between a bear and its kill was not the place to be, and uh, that's when we started moving off. Reeking of blood, Dave and Gary are desperate to avoid another bear encounter. Bears are unpredictable. You never know what it is that's going to provoke them to attack you. We were definitely in the position to have that happen at any moment. One of the items we had was a bear whistle. 
and we just blow on that pretty much all the time. You don't want to surprise a bear. That's the worst thing you can do. Your senses are really on high alert. stumble onto the bank of a 10 meter wide river. If they can reach the other side, they should be out of the bear's territory. Dave is the first to try and wade across. As he starts to enter the, the creek, I'm looking over my shoulder. I'm looking for that big old grizzly bear. The water was ice cold. Of course, the whole balancing act with the pack and the pain and and everything was was challenging. And then lost my footing and got pulled downstream. I turn around and look, and Dave's gone. I look downstream. And there's Dave. He washed downstream about 20, 25 yards or so. In the fast-flowing torrent, Dave's broken collarbone and ribs make trying to swim agony. Soon, he's freezing cold and struggling just to keep his head above water. Hang on, I'm coming! Dave manages to drag himself to shallow water. But on a day when the temperature is barely four degrees Celsius, his body temperature is plummeting. I'm thinking, great, this, this is not good, you know. You now he's gonna get hypothermia. Come on, let's get you dried off. No, no. Gary said, you know, you need to wring out all your clothes. We've gotta get out of here. Dave decides that getting dry isn't their biggest concern. We're still within proximity of where we had just seen this bear, and I said, "No, we'll just we'll just trek hard, and uh, I'll just try to body heat it out." Dave is risking hypothermia. Now more than ever, the two friends need rescuing. Thirty kilometers away in Palmer, the men's wives have raised the alarm and an air search has been underway all day. But the rescue teams are unaware that the two men are much higher up the mountains than anticipated and beyond the limits of their search area. For now, Dave and Gary are on their own. Yeah, I remember uh, Dave falling several times. You all right? But he wouldn't complain. You, you just get up and keep on going and uh, I could tell he was hurting. With every movement, over the uneven terrain, Dave's broken ribs threaten to puncture a lung. If that happens before they reach safety, he might not survive. You could just feel the piercing inside in the chest, and it was, it was uncomfortable. Dave is the one in pain. But the men still don't realize that it's Gary who's in the most serious danger. The skull fracture he suffered in the crash puts him at risk of a brain hemorrhage. We're hiking hard here, and we're sweating, and we're putting out energy, and it was just like you could never take on enough water. I was so thirsty, I didn't care if it was dirty, I didn't care what was in it. I was, I was determined to get some moisture in my mouth. And then we remembered we had a jar of peanut butter. 
The peanut butter they retrieved from the plane is a godsend. It's not much, but it gives the men a desperately needed boost. Peanut butter was always good to eat. You could feel a little pickup. Yeah, it was just like a shot of energy, so packed with protein and, and the sugars. Oh. It was the first time I had probably eaten in well over 24 hours. And I, was, I remember how good that peanut butter tasted. The friends continue hiking south in the general direction of the Kinnick River. That was a lot further journey than uh, what we'd imagined. Every time you come over a rise, you'd think, it's going to be, we're going to see it. But the rough terrain and their worsening injuries make progress painfully slow. We carried on for a couple hours. Our bodies were uh, growing more and more exhausted at this point. And then I looked up. And we caught our first glimpse of the Canuck River down below us. That was where we're trying to get to. After hiking for more than 20 kilometers through the brutal Alaskan wilderness, the two friends can see the river, which they hope will lead them back to civilization. Try. We decided it's time to go down and try to get out through the valley floor. Facing a long, slow descent to the valley below, they decide to take a shortcut. But it means scrambling down a steep, wooded slope. It just got steeper and steeper and wetter and wetter, and the underbrush was just really green. The ground was slippery. You had to be careful with every step because uh, you could really break an ankle or twist a knee. You had to hang on to brush. It was so steep that if you let go, you're just going to tumble out of control. All of a sudden, my feet slipped out from underneath me, and I started sliding down the hill. Unable to stop himself. Dave is hurtling towards the edge of a 15-meter precipice. We're picking up speed. As the branches are going by, I'm reaching out with my arm. I look down, and there's nothing underneath me. I stopped solid. And then I went to put my feet underneath me and there wasn't anything there. And I looked down, and it was uh, another drop on down to the bottom. Hang on, buddy, I'm coming! Finally, I pulled myself up until I could get my feet underneath me. Had I have gone off of that, they may not be sitting here. I realized that, that was probably the worst mistake of the whole journey. Dave and Gary's shortcut has badly backfired. Let's go. Exhausted from their exertions and the pain of their injuries, they now have to climb nearly 150 meters back up a 45 degree slope. That was a pretty demoralizing point. Right there, we're just trying to get back all the way up to where we started from. It was pretty steep. Dave is in a bad way. The fall aggravated his broken ribs. And now, every breath is agony. I was just grasping for air. <laughs> There was a concern there about what, what it was that was going to happen next with your body, because you could feel things weren't working as they should be. 
The grueling climb saps what little strength Dave has left. And now Gary's in trouble too. Uh, uh, I don't feel good. I'm thinking something weird is going on here. Gary, we gotta keep going. Man, this is really strange. But uh, I knew we had to keep on going. What you doing? It's this way. Uh, it's this way. He's going, why are we going south? I promise you, it's this way. I've normally got a great sense of direction, but I think in the, uh, the injuries to my forehead, I'm, I'm, we're beginning to take a toll. Gary's growing confusion is a worrying symptom of his fractured skull and severe concussion. Up to this point, he's taken the lead. But now, he realizes that it's his turn to rely on Dave. At this point, I decided to follow Dave's lead. I mean, he was, uh, seemed to be thinking clearly. Gary needs urgent medical attention. The search efforts continue. But as the friend's unplanned detour took them way off the usual flight path, the search doesn't extend to where they're stranded. Twenty-four hours after the crash, Dave and Gary still haven't reached the Kennet River, their route back to civilization. Oh. I... I gotta rest. Then, Gary catches sight of something through the trees. And then uh, I can remember seeing what I thought was a hunter. I thought, man, that's odd. It's not even hunting season. Dave! Look! Gary, what is it? I saw a hunter. Gary, there's nothing there. At this point, I'm starting to understand that Gary's operating in, in some sort of a reduced mental capacity. Gary's erratic behavior is worrying Dave. For the first time, he realizes that his friend's head injury could be life-threatening. Watching Gary go through that, it increased my feelings of guilt for having caused the accident in the first place. It gave me a drive to want to do everything I could to make sure that we could get to some help quick. The friend's hike to safety just became a race against the clock. Dave pushes on determined to get his friend the medical help he so desperately needs. And I turned around and there was no Gary. I thought, how can that be? He was just here. You know, where did Gary go? Gary? has disappeared. His worsening head injury makes him completely reliant on his friend for survival. Dave retraces his steps, fearful of what he might find. I'm here, Gary, come on. When I called him and he didn't answer. Come on. And I called him again and he didn't answer. That was a very low moment. If Dave can't find his friend, he will die. All of a sudden, his whistle went off. He had tripped and fallen in the brush. It was just amazing to see Gary again. 
I began to taper off, mainly due to the impact to my forehead, and I really began to hallucinate. And I remember thinking at this point, man, I'm sure glad Dave was there with me because I did realize that he was thinking right. The two men are tantalizingly close to the Kanik River, their route map to civilization. Come on, keep going. But Gary's condition is getting worse with every step. He could slip into unconsciousness at any time. But then I heard the sound of an aircraft. Look! It was headed right up towards us. It's a de Havilland Beaver, it's red. Uh, I know the people who even operate the airplane. It's that close, I can see it. Quick, quick, flare. The plane is flying upriver towards the Kinnick Glacier. Gary and Dave scramble for the emergency flare they retrieved from their aircraft. The timing just perfect. He is coming right at us, and I shot the flare off right in front of the plane. And I'm thinking, it just doesn't get any better than that. The flare started to illuminate. got to its crest, the plane banked away 180 degrees away from us. He never so much as saw it. It was disheartening to me to see the plane fly off. There has to be the golden moment uh, for a rescue, and it wasn't our golden moment. It's a crushing blow. Gary's survival chances just took a major hit. The men stumble on, but now even the terrain seems to conspire against them. It is just nothing but tangled sticks and brush. We literally couldn't see much more than about um, about 50 feet. It's thick. It's, it's really thick. Gary, okay. come on. I could really just feel a sinking feeling coming on me. It would take 10 times the effort to just go five feet. And now, Gary has completely lost his grip on reality. I would see camps, campfires, tents. They would just uh, vaporize, they would just vanish. There was nothing there. As the light fades, Dave starts to feel desperate. Come on, keep coming. He's convinced that Gary won't survive another night out here. Come on, Gary, get up. Keep coming, keep coming. Come. Watching Gary not move as fast, being quieter, that was a real sinking feeling. Quietly, I talked to God and prayed for our survival. And then I hear car engines. And I think, no, that's not car engines. Then I hear it again. And then I hear a big roar. And then 
uh, I see lights shining through the trees. By some miracle, Gary and Dave have stumbled onto a logging road and a car full of holiday makers. They come running up to us there and it was just the most awesome thing. I was very blessed to be alive. After 33 hours alone in the wilderness, Dave and Gary are finally rescued. We were going home. It's remarkable that we survived the crash. It's remarkable that we were in physical condition to be able to walk out. And it's remarkable that we did not have a physical encounter with a bear. The men were rushed to hospital in Parma, where doctors treated Gary's head injury. He was lucky not to need surgery, but it took him nearly six months to get over the effects of his fractured skull. An air search took two weeks to locate Dave's crashed plane. Despite his terrifying ordeal, Dave was back at the controls within two months. I'll continue to fly, I'll continue to love aviation um, very much. I, I don't see my life without it. In fact, Dave is renovating another aircraft to replace the one he lost on the mountain. I'm fortunate to be able to go on as a pilot and I'll encourage others, including Gary. I hope that he continues on to get his pilot's license. The experience has made Dave and Gary's bond of friendship even stronger. Me and Dave have grown really close. You don't go through an experience like that. Somebody can survive and not come out of it a lot closer. Could I have done this alone? I don't think so. I think that uh, if it wasn't for Gary being there, that um, I wouldn't be here.